higher, or as, as I've been told, A up in, in Nottingham, which I really, really like. Um, so when I get really nervous, I either talk really quickly, tell really stupid jokes, or just talk about a lot of nonsense. So you're getting the latter side of that today. So thank you very much for being with us. And thank you to Simon and to Jerry and to Kenneth as well for having me and for how amazing they've been. They're a brilliant bunch of lads. So that's great. Um, hi, I'm Natalie and I work in a... Oh, is the slide's gone. Hey. Um, I work in a museum. Da -da. You can find us on the internet. We do exist on the internet. Um, and existing in digital culture um, can feel a bit like how theorist Amanda Lagavist describes as the persistent presence of the infinite in the age of temporal insanity, which is a lot of very big words. Theorists love very big words. Academics love very big words. And I really like this phrase, but I kind of like simplifying it a little bit as being a human in a digital world, it's a lot all of the time. I mean, obviously, I'm massively simplifying, simplifying? Simplifying it. I mean, I like this quote because it's a way for me to understand the weight of digital culture as someone who deals with it all of the time, in public, with the public, for the public. To kind of give an example, as technologies become more complex, it becomes a bit harder for them to explain. I mean, many of you may have seen this uh, graph before. Um, it's also known as Bruno Latour's black box. Kind of as things go in, you kind of see the input of things and you kind of see the output of things, but you don't quite see what happens in the middle because they're quite opaque and they're things that kind of you don't quite see. You combine that with our existing human relationships and behaviours and then the subsequent relationships and behaviours those technologies create and facilitate and enable and complicate, which are then fed back into the design of new systems, and you've got a much larger level of complexity. No one ever saw the Tinder effect, for instance, happening or like Instagram influencers. All of these things happen as a result of design, facilitating behaviours, facilitating design, and this kind of circular, interesting, brilliant complexity that makes up human life I'm really interested in as a kind of somewhere between a design historian, investigative journalist, um, I don't know, chancer, which is what my job kind of has become in some ways. But then you cross that with sort of different speeds, from conversations to the ability for data to cross countries in seconds to the rate at which information can be computed to telecommunications and multiply that by a bunch of other larger factors, for instance, capitalism and government actors, which is kind of where the question mark tends to sit, the things that kind of tend to keep those things opaque and covered up. And you have a, a confusing mess on your hands. And that's where that renewing, and as Lagerbeth mentioned, that insanity tends to happen, that constant sort of pulse that keeps on going over and over and over itself because it happens so quickly that it's very hard for us to see, which is why it's really difficult for us. And that's where a lot of... Um, what is very difficult for us to see ourselves in it and for us to place ourselves in it in that way. And it means it's very difficult for us to try and represent and to know what we want to keep and for us to know how we want to represent and show ourselves to others and especially for the future in that particular way. Um, again, more theory, because sometimes it's just good to get our brains working a little bit on a... I just completely forgot what day it was. Is it Thursday? Yes. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Um, according to uh, Ben Stiegler, to be human, we go through a constant kind of process of, of individuation, which is un understanding who we are as people, which sits in an understanding of like the collective and, and who we are um, and how we distinguish ourselves between entities like buildings and trees and, and other things um, and others and the world that we inhabit around us. And he has this really chewy quote that he obviously said at art galleries, because art galleries is where things sometimes can kind of go to die. Um, he said, the I as psychic individual, so who we perceive as ourselves as like a perceptible person who perceives things, cannot be thought except to the extent that it belongs to a we, which is a collective individual. The I constitutes itself through the adoption of a collective history, so how we understand ourselves as, as ex kind of experiencing history, which it inherits and with which a plurality of eyes identify. Now, the plurality of eyes is the fact that we kind of, no person is an island, that we exist kind of as an I, but as a we together. And that perception of culture kind of exists in comparison to others. And the way we write it down in some ways is kind of through technology. And he talks about this as a tertiary retention, which is a fancy word as memories recorded through technology. Now, technology can be language, it's the alphabet, like, technology is not just Twitter, as much as we'd like to think of it as just being something we can delete. 
I think techni technology comes from the word Latin word techne, which means knowledge. It's, a, it's the idea of how we choose to communicate and be with others. And you, you kind of have to forgive me a little bit of this, this theory, because the reason why I kind of wanted to say all this stuff is because it helps contextualise my job a little bit. And the reason why I do what I do, because it kind of gives a weight to the reason why um, culture is so important, because suddenly it really makes us think about what we're losing and the things that, and why we choose to keep what we do and why it's important that we, that we one, make sense of it as being something that ultimately is um, something that's all of us, but also we understand the politics of it and the politics of what we choose to keep and why it's there. And I'll kind of go into that a little bit more in detail there. Um, in the future and, and why we, well, we had to politicise the now as well as politicising the past and, and the reason why we've kind of been given a, quite an interesting opportunity uh, to do that, particularly with the rate of change that's happening and what we're uncovering about kind of our current state of technology. But just a very brief pause and kind of how I got to doing this weird job and why the V&A kind of has a curator of digital design. Um, so... I didn't study art history or design history, and I didn't decide, kind of study digital design curation history because it does, just doesn't exist as a discipline. I uh, did a BA in English literature. I attempted a master's, which I didn't couldn't afford because it, it, you can't really get grants for what I was trying to do, and it was really st stupid, and I ended up working at a call centre, which obviously I really enjoyed. Love working at a call centre. People really love people who work in call centres. Um, where it's like, hello. Uh, also, I managed to master like five different voices. If anyone's ever worked in a charity call centre, uh, you master like five different voices, which is the WWF voice, which is, hello, would you like to uh, give five pound a month to WWF? And then you have the Marie Curie voice, which is much more doomy. And then you have the Royal British Legion voice, which is much posher. Um, which is like, hello, is that Brigadier Johnson? Uh, would you like to give £50 a month to the Royal British Legion? Um, but then, obviously, I just didn't want to do that forever because that was soul-destroying and terrible. Um, and at that particular time, I discovered digital art and coding for the web, which was kind of a weird combination of things. I started volunteering at an amazing place called Lighthouse, um, but also ended up weirdly being introduced to coding for the web by uh, hilariously Laura Kalberg and Errol, who Laura's going to be speaking later. And they welcomed me into the community and taught me some skills that I'm now too rusty and terrible to use now. Um, but introduced me to this in incredible group of people that I, I now know um, and, uh, and kind of have since now become a weird historian of, which is strange. Um, but I also worked at this gallery, which in introduced me to this really interesting, critical view of technology that I just hadn't really thought about before. Because I grew up watching, like, Tomorrow's World and thinking that technology was, like, amazing and that everything about technology was going to save us. Because I was like, oh, like, you can... We're going to live on the, the moon and Jetpack's going to be amazing. I never doubted technology was going to save us. And I think that's the, the dream that we had at that particular point in history. But then I went to Lighthouse and like, had my dreams completely demolished in a really nice, safe environment. And the first um, place that I ended up working at was, was this place called Lighthouse with this brilliant woman called Anna Harja. Sorry, I've managed to get a cold since I've been in Nottingham, so you have to excuse me for a second. Um, and at Lighthouse, we ended up doing these really amazing and weird projects where um, we took technology and the things that we assumed and kind of broke them apart a little bit and, and introduced an, an audience that perhaps hadn't had those critical conversations and, and kind of made them new. So this is a project with uh, Julian Oliver and Daniel Vasiliev, and what you're seeing is a picture of a fake news journalism office um, where they, they created this, this kind of wall plug that when you put it into the wall, you could essentially hack the front pages of any major news site that you wanted to, to for the, the news website to say anything you wanted. And obviously, within the confines of a gallery, it was a bit of fun because you could kind of it, you knew when you stepped into the gallery that it was an it was an artifice. It was wasn't real. You knew that when you walked in, it was kind of fake. But the whole provocation of the art project was that if you took this into a cafe on an open Wi-Fi network, that anyone if they went on their phone onto the Daily World website and someone kind of said had, had hacked that website and it said like I don't know. Um, I'm thinking the news just feels really mad at the moment, so I can't think of anything like <laughs> remote, remotely like I don't know. Uh, Prince Philip is secretly an alien, that kind of thing. And they, this is this is in 2014, so this is way before the fake news thing. 
the, 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 the whole idea of there being um, us doubting these media conglomerates at that time was quite an interesting conversation. It came through kind of conversations around uh, being able to hack and manipulate technology and what it meant to be part of that conversation. Um, and the fact that, that anyone could do it, they, they released the, the plans to do that. Um, and that was the most prov provocative bit, the fact that anyone could download the code for that and do it on their own, which obviously is quite a, an interesting conversation because, I don't know, the idea of, of, of who could use it for good or bad is obviously a, a long-going conversation around uh, technology. Um, and then when I was working with that, I ended up working with a really great uh, group called Changest, who are a strategic foresight and futures kind of a group. And we worked on a project called Thin Clash, which was, again, looking at kind of the future of product design and the idea about how, when you create all these products, they have unintended consequences, as many of the previous speakers have mentioned. The idea of when you create things like beacons or smart jackets or smart cards, you have this idea of what the intended users are. But when you kind of you have an idea of an intended user, the whole point is that you would move that user across different objects and different scenarios, and every clash you would note and you would write down what that clash would be, and you keep on changing and keep on chopping and changing until you kind of exhausted that. And it was just a mechanism and a tool that, that was done, but it opened me up again to futures, which is an industry I'd never heard of and was full of crazy people. No offence to the previous two speakers, they're lovely. They're not crazy. Um, and then I ended up working as a curator at Future Everything, which kind of combined those two things in a really weird and interesting way. <coughs> um, by figuring out how you can use digital art and digital design as a, as a communications method to talk about difficult and critical kind of conversations that the public were having around technology. So I ended up working in Singapore and Taiwan and Manchester to try and explain things like what happens if, en if like energy just becomes a, a very finite resource where we have to work collectively to decide where this distribution works. Very similar actually to the project that Kenneth showed. And we did a project in Taiwan based on very real life circumstances that are happening in Taiwan where whole swathes of their infrastructure just has to be switched off to save um, to save energy in the villages. Like literally it would be switched off for like four hours every night because that just that's just the reality of the situation. So we took it to larger cities to try and explain to them that the distribution of power that happened just within their backyards and that kind of thing. Um, and did art projects to try and use kind of ways of talking about that. So I've always been really interested in how the politic, how you bring to the fore and the front the politics of technology. And it's something that we've always kind of known about. And it's not like, the, like design is inherently political. It always has been. Just because we haven't talked about it before doesn't mean that it hasn't been. It just, it has. It's just a case that we haven't really thought to maybe draw a line under it. I mean, the VNA, when I joined there in 2017, um, didn't really have a curator of digital design, but it did have a, an amazing department called uh, DAD, who were founded in 2015 by uh, Corinna Gardner, who I work with now, and Kieran Long. And the whole point of this department was to sit aside from a discipline or a chronology or a specific medium, and was to look at design and public life. So it was like, what is the impact that design is having on public life and society? What is the impact that design is going to have on us as a, as a public, as people. And I had the most amazing place to have lunch, which is this ridiculous place here, but you have to avoid the children. Um, not because I hate children, but because the water, which is filled with children's artefacts, <laughs> which is the best way I could describe it. And it's home to some really amazing initiatives that we worked on a really... Um, I get to work with the Rapid Response Collection. So this is Corinna holding up the Extinction Rebellion uh, graphic design branding that we collected uh, last year. Which So Rapid Response Collecting, for those who don't know, is our kind of groundbreaking initiative that we did. I mean, I can say that because we were the first people to do it, and I'm really proud that we did it because it's amazing. Um, where we collect objects at the time they kind of hit the news or hit the, the, like, the media as being an example where a object is, is a particular indicator of a political moment. So we collected, collected um, a set of branding from Extinction Rebellion at, during their first protest. And we don't collect it um, as an archive or as a way of sort of 
kind of we don't go and rush and collect things. We collect them very specifically because we want to talk about graphic design and the impact it has on a particular group or in a particular way of communicating about something. So we also have things like the Liberator 3D printed gun, which we collected when it first was banned by the US government. We have the pussy hat from the Women's Day March that we collected from the founders. Um, we also have things like the, um, the burkini um, when it was first banned uh, by the Cannes government. We collect things when design becomes inherently and explicitly politicised and we have conversations with our, with our, our uh, visitors about it. But that's just to give you an idea of the kind of approach that we take as a, as a department. So digital design sits in that department and it sits with me primarily um, and this is the first time that we've ever brought digital design specifically into this, this space and we tried to give it a definition and this is the first time we've actually written it into our collection strategy ever and I'm going to share it with you as a group of practitioners for the first time in public and I'm really sorry if it's even remotely wrong and I'm really this is, I'm welcoming it, welcoming it up to you as a group of people that um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it this is what we understand, there's one part of many to this, not the only bit I'm going to add up, of what we understand digital design to be. So we think it's one of many parts. So product design, software and physical computing, systems and industrial design, web design and social media, interaction interface and, inf and information design, video games and com communications design, new media and computer programming. Now, we completely understand that obviously those things fold into other things, but if, for instance, with things like social media, we wanted to make it very clear that those things are, can be design systems in themselves that have particular sort of designed um, areas of study that we want to kind of have a look at. But for us, it's really important that we kind of we want to make sure those things are, um, are kind of segmented, and I'll explain a little bit why later but with the acquisition of certain objects that we have pulled in. But we also wanted to have uh, a few more distinctions around what we understand kind of digital design to be on a perhaps more sort of phenomenological level, if I can use that word. So digital design works between the physical and the digital, between the concrete and the abstract, and it often has no immediate edges or boundaries. It can exist across a number of different scales, from the personal to the planetary. So we wanted to kind of show the fact that the digital, for instance, it works on infrastructure, on data servers. It, it has a physical material element to it. It's not just data. It's not just the thing that comes up on your computer. It has a real cost, which for us, for instance, in our collection strategy, we also acknowledge the, the role that climate change and climate impact has on the production of these technologies. I haven't obviously included it here for the sake of time, but if you want to read more into our, our collection strategy, we have included things like, like that into it because it's important that when we collect and understand these things that we understand that they have had an impact on, on the planet in that particular way. But I'm going to take you through a few of our objects just to show you kind of the kind of things that we've acquired and mostly the kind of challenges because we will need you at some point and we would really like your help and really like your thinking as practitioners and people who probably have played and dealt and will work on this stuff. And it's really important that we invite you into these conversations as much as I try and look in history books. But I mean, I'll talk about the oldest thing in our collection first and probably one of the most openly misogynist things in our collection, if you want to see that, because that's fun. The Apple II. Apple II, I love this object. So the Apple II, um, look at this advert, it's great. Um, the Apple II um, was uh, created in 1978, and it was the first kind of, the reason why we collect objects, just to let you know, we don't collect chronologically, we don't collect because we want to kind of, we're not, we're not the, our, our approach is not um, chronological in that we want to collect every single co computer that Apple did. We collect for specific purposes. So we collected um, the Apple II because it was the first time that the computer really made it in the domestic environment and the domestic sphere. It was the first time you brought your work home, which is kind of a, now we think about it, we're like, oh, God damn it, that's when it started. Um, when it's like, oh, darling, I've brought this, like, whizzy machine home, and I can do graphs in the kitchen now. And she's like, darling, I'm just cutting some tomatoes. I think she's cutting some tomatoes. And there's like a little nod to the Apple One advert in the background, which is a little Apple. Um, and like, it's, it's kind of bad. We also acquired the Sanyo monitor that it came with as well, which is, which is the one, it's a shame I didn't put it up here, because it basically we acquired the monitor that, that Steve Jobs used to like wield around the back of his car, because I wanted the one that he like struggled with 
rather than the one that was in showcases in, um, in shops because I, I preferred that story of him struggling than anything else because I'm a sadist. Um, but then, uh, but the, so we acquired that in terms of like showing them. But obviously, we we have uh, we also have a copy of VisiCalc. So if anyone wants to know what the first killer app was, it was a spreadsheet. It was a Microsoft Excel. So if anyone who has problems with Excel, you can thank that for uh, for everything. Um, so we acquired that, and we have a number of those things. But obviously, we only acquire those things in terms of like the, the fact that that was a that was the kind of a real major thing in computing. We also have objects like the Nest Learning Thermostat and the Thingamatic by MakerBot. Um, the Nest Learning Thermostat we acquired at the time that there was a major data breach of user data um, when uh, the, I think it was the, the, the postcodes and user um, IDs of people were leaked uh, at a particular time in 2014. So we acquired that. But the thing is, again, as you'll notice, there's a bit of a trend when I start talking about these objects. Um, that we can't acquire the onboard software or the um, the actual interaction of that object. We kind of we had the done kind of product design of the Nest, but it's actually very hard for us to be able to acquire the onboard um, software or the interface because we can't have access to it because Nest obviously will not give it to us because it's proprietary and it's their IP. And this becomes an ongoing problem for us. While with the MakerBot, it's less of a problem because. I mean, we, we, we acquired it for the hardware and, and the way that we wanted to kind of represent it was as a, an object that you'd see in a maker lab and it's, and it's that. Um, but we didn't want to acquire the, the CAD software as well because that's something that we have to think about in the future when we start to look at things like CAD and, um, and other software that we want to represent that side of the maker community. I mean, that was the one on the left was acquired from a maker lab in Montreal. It's very hard to find maker bots that aren't destroyed because people just use them for spare parts or just literally, I've, I, those people were like, oh no, we just completely destroyed it because it's terrible. Um, which is like, I was like, thanks. And like trying to contact Bree Pettis to ask him for one, which is fine. <coughs> um, we also acquired the Xbox Adaptive Controller, um, which is a, a piece of equipment that was created with um, X, Microsoft and Special Effects and a number of different uh, disability charities who aimed to create a, a piece of equipment that could be added to Xboxes, the rest of Xboxes, a uh, range of, of kind of controllers to allow for those who had particular ability, kind of limited abilities to play games. Uh, and you can kind of plug objects in, like other kind of devices, and you can reprogram the pads so that you can play um, games in the way that you kind of want to for your own particular kind of configuration. And the, re the reason why I really like it is because it kind of ch forced them to change their innovation cycle. They had to extend it from one year to two years um, to allow for the fact they had to do a bunch of different user testing. They had to work with different rehabilitation hospitals, that kind of thing. And also the packaging for it is really great. Like you can, you can open it with the, the way the tabs and uh, the design of the packaging itself is really well designed so that you don't need, it's not kind of fiddly um, bits and pieces that you need to use. It's really well designed so it's a bit more accessible. But we also acquire things which um, make the invisible visible or use things or use ways of um, bringing to light things which are really difficult to explain. So I'm going to take some water before I try and explain this. <coughs> so Radical Love by Heather Dewey Hagborg is a series of portraits of the uh, famous whistleblower Chelsea Manning, which were taken during her incarceration in, she was, in, she was incarcerated for about seven years for leaking documents of US war crimes. So these were taken through a process called DNA phenotyping, which was a very um, controversial and I'm going to say very dangerous piece of technology. It uses uh, swabbing to create a DNA profile of someone that is then sequenced to create a, a picture of you, which does not look like you, but can, has and will falsely incarcerate lots of people, particularly people of colour. Um, and it also has, while that kind of speculations around gender. Now, at this time, Chelsea was going through a transition, and she, she kind of used this on itself and kind of turned it into a way that she could kind of create a portrait for herself at a, a time when she wasn't able to create a portrait for herself. So she worked with Heather to create a gender and uh, gender neutral and a female portrait of herself while she was incarcerated. So we acquired this with kind of obviously with both her permission and acquired the piece of work. Um, and now it's in our collection. But essentially, we wouldn't be able to show 
how difficult DNA fair saving was just by showing the software, because it doesn't really tell you anything because there's no data and no DNA there. But by acquiring these, we could show you the, the kind of the difficulties in how almost how redundant the classifications of gender they are. Which is why it's difficult with things like <coughs> the iPhone, for instance. The iPhone is a really difficult story to tell for us at the BNA. We acquired it back in 2014, and we actually have the, the iPhone 1 <coughs> from 2007. And we would love to tell the story of the iPhone, regardless of how you feel about Apple or not, because even if you're not a big fan and you hate it and think it's ruined the world and Steve Jobs is terrible and, and Johnny Ives is terrible and his psychopathic open office project is... Which I've, I, I still think about his open offices all the time. Have you ever seen the images of the way that he makes his product designers think or, or like operate, where like you can't have any personal effects, you can't have anything on your desk, or, or, or like the way that you operate? Maybe it's a mythology that, I've, that has been instilled, but I find it really interesting, all of these ways. But for a long time, um, this, this story went around that I find really um, interesting about Johnny Ives making his senior product designers carry a dumb um, plastic brick of the iPhone 6 in their pockets for a long time to make them live with the curve. The idea of the, the phone, this sort of magical tablet idea. <coughs> <coughs> Completely mad. Um, but the iPhone 6 for us, we only collected basically for its material properties in some ways, because we can't switch it on. Because when you switch it on, it will connect to the internet and it will break the phone, which is useless to us as a museum. Um, and we can't, we, we can't really work with Apple. I mean, maybe we can, we tried to work with Apple to try and get something which maybe make it work for us. But it's like losing half of a painting for us. It's like literally covering up half a painting. We lose so much and so much of the history because of this issue around... And it's also it's an issue that's perhaps as bigger than us. It's like losing the ability for IP. <coughs> Sorry, access to IP and access to um, that. But I want to, want to give you an example of, of what's lost and why that's lost with the first object that I ever collected, which is this. Anyone know what this is before them reading the bottom? <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I've got a terrible cough which is really awful, and I'm messing with my label mic. Um, anyone have one of these? Oh, yes. Anyone attempted to bring one back to life? You have. I'm going to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Fine. Um, I have one of these in my home because my partner's great and bought me one for Christmas, um, but I haven't actually brought it back to life yet because I have no skills. Um, I love the Minitel. The Minitel is a brilliant, ridiculous object that is responsible for why the France basically didn't like the internet for a really long time. Um, it started in 1986, um, and at the kind of peak of its time, 9 million were in operation and 25 million users were using it. They're kind of amazing, and they're ridiculous, because they, they were basically brought in by France Telecom to replace the phone book because the phone book was like an insane waste of money for France Telecom. So they were like, ah, oh, so what are we going to do? We're gonna, it's kind of like the plastic bags were used to replace the paper bags. It's kind of weirdly mad problem in that way. We, sorry, we, I'm not France Telecom. France Telecom, um, they decided to bring it in uh, with their video text service, um, which was the Minitel service. Um, and you could do a bunch of amazing things on it. You could, um, as a magazine service, you could book cinema tickets, you could uh, chat to people, you could chat to women. 3615 Ula. Um, they're very sexy. There's an amazing story in a book called uh, Welcome to Minitel by uh, the Minitel Research Lab. There's a guy in his garage with like 14 Minitels, all pretending to be 14 different women. And it's just like literally just kind of going, um, but because you could make money off of it, people became like Minitel millionaires. I'm going to brand that as a thing. Um, and I, I love this kind of weird history of it because it, it kind of came with this like own kind of like almost like kind of this community of people. Of course it did because it was like people loved it. They absolutely loved it because it was so um, it was run by people. Anyone could host a service on it. It was kind of like a weird uh, proxy of like a, of the socialist internet essentially. 
and you had amazing things like the web, like the adverts that would run on the on the, like TV and like this amazing thing. Come on. Oh no. Are you going to run? I do have an amazing video of a advert, but for some reason it's not working. Okay, imagine um, that basically there's an, there's an amazing video. You can look it up. It's called 3615HORO. And it's a video of a, um, a horoscope service with like a French mystic Meg. That's all I can explain to you. Um, but it has such an important cultural significance because it had this, um, this kind of fan culture around it. And it operated, it didn't operate like a laptop. It kind of operated something next to your phone terminal. And like, um, it, but the thing is, but it didn't have any internal memory. It entirely existed like on, with France Telecom. So the minute it was shut off in 2012, which was quite late, 40,000 people were still using it. Um, and the minute it switched off, everything was lost. Everything about Minitel, all the services, everything that was, that was there was just gone. And that, is a, for me, is like a, a synonym to something like everyone who's had an Internet of Things project has just gone offline. Little Printer, am I right? I remember when Little Printer went down. It was really sad. The little face. Um, but this is what I mean. This is the thing that we have to think about. And like, this is the things that... And it's, I know that it sounds like a thing that maybe we should get used to this ephemerality and should get used to this kind of stuff. But I'm quite intrigued by the, the, the idea of the stories we tell each other combined with the design that facilitates and, and enable us to understand this stuff. Because the, the, the design means something. It's not just... A, like we can talk about the, the design and the story and all of that kind of thing. We can, we can tell each other what it's like to use these things and to use those things. And the history and the social science and the stories and, and all of the writing that we can have and the documentary can be some things. But I saw a big advocate for understanding how that design can tell another story through its facilitation. I mean, we tried to acquire WeChat at one point, which was, ah, oh, gifts. So this gift is a museum object. I've been able to take a museum object out of the museum. So we have 150 of these, which are museum objects. Um, when we acquired the WeChat um, social media platform, so for those who don't know, WeChat is, it has about a billion users, maybe more. It's the biggest social media um, platform in uh, Asia. It's, you can do anything on it. You can pay for like bike rides. You can do uh, banking. You can talk to your friends. It's everything that like, Facebook Messenger tried to do but failed. If you remember when Facebook Messenger tried to, to kind of fold everything into one app. Um, but when we worked with Tencent, we, we literally tried to collect everything around the object and the culture of the object. We quite acquired this amazing thumb monster called Monmon, who is a Internet of, of Things kind of object where if you are a parent who works long distance, you can text him um, and a heart will come up on his, on his body. Um, but the problem is like, we, it doesn't give you any sense of what it was like to be a 16-year-old girl on WeChat because we couldn't acquire any profiles or any people or any things that kind of give you an idea of the interactivity or, or the things that were there because of the issues around not being able to preserve that stuff. So that's another thing that we have. And finally, this monster object. So we acquired this this year because we spent so much time talking about how to acquire it because it's just a piece of dumb product design. So Amazon Echo, for instance, have made a colossal loss on this object, like insane of, like, loss in terms of their sales, because they just want it, obviously it's just access to a service, it's just a way for them to get you onto Amazon and their buying mechanism, which is like, just, it's very clever, it's a very, very clever way of doing it. But for us as a design museum, we need to find a way of recording and understanding that design mechanism and that assistance design, as I mentioned to you, in terms of understanding di digital design. We've really struggled with this, so we acquired alongside it this amazing project by Kate Crawford and Vladan Jolaire called Anatomy of an AI. This map is three meters by five meters wide. It's absolutely huge. And what it is, is a massive collection of everything that, that, that they could find that researchers knew about the, at the Amazon Echo, from the smelting, the refining, the mining, the, the materials, the way they train the AI, 
the disposal process, the um, the people who are involved in monitoring the the like the, the language processing, every possible thing. It's absolutely huge and it's amazing. And I encourage all of you who want to find out more about how that process works to kind of have a dig through it, just a bit of a, a kind of zoom in for what it's there. So we wanted to kind of while also acquiring those kind of big mechanisms and also because we're, we're not trying to hold a position as well from the VNA, we're not trying to kind of say how we feel about a particular thing. We want to show the politics embedded in technology, but we also want to kind of show different perspectives. So while acquiring the Amazon, we want to acquire those who, who make the invisible visible. It kind of shows all of these things. It's like, here is everything that's in the Amazon Alexa. We, it's not easy to show that by acquiring the Alexa on its own. So we acquire a project that also does that at the same time. Um, and it's an amazing project, which I, quite, I implore all of you to spend some time with. So, I think I have like two minutes left. So, <clears throat> I thought I'd just kind of finish on my final slide of reckons from a curator who spends a lot of time worrying about technology and how a museum that's 157, 158 years old tries to reckon with it. Because I'm just me. I have an amazing team of like 10 people who all work on different places and different things, from architecture to design and products. There will hopefully be more of me, I hope, in the future. So, <coughs> if I don't cough my way through this, I do apologize. So, to know how we got here by acknowledging the politics embedded in all design, so we can imagine better futures. That, that's, that's, that's how I try to think about the work that I do. Like, to really highlight and emphasize that, because if you work in, the cultural sector at understanding the role that politics has, so the design has in our cultural histories and the collective futures, you have to acknowledge it's political. You cannot sit above and beyond it. You cannot be neutral. There is no such thing as neutrality if you work in culture or design. There's no space for it. I won't have it. I won't have it. Um, to contextualize design with collective histories and vice versa. So this is why I mentioned about that, that idea of it's not, it's, I, I'm, I understand the idea of having records and stories and, and written histories, but I, I really advocate the idea of being able to access design and interaction and the abilities of having, which is why we spend so much time trying to preserve it. And then to be open and collaborative with our knowledge, so trying to find people who work with us to do it, and if we can't do that, to enable those who allow us to see. Thank you. Museums are cool. Support your local museum, not just the v &A, because we've got, I mean, we're, we're all right. But like, <laughs> museums are like support your local one because they're really cool and they probably need you more than the V&A does most of the time. Um, thank you.